everybody, welcome to our next lecture, which is about the cell theory. Before you watch this video, please make sure you watch the TED Ed that I put up on Canvas for you. It is a very, very informative, but also a fun way to take a look at how the cell theory came about. Um, so please make sure you watch that before you watch this one. But if you watch the other video, you're going to get introduced to a bunch of different scientists and how they um, develop the microscope, right? Some of you guys might have used microscope before in high school. If you're taking 101 lab, if you've taken 101 lab, you might have seen or used a microscope. But these are the important people that you need to be mindful of when it comes to the discovery of cells and the microscope, right? The video, again, the TED Ed gives you a lot more information, but I'm just going to have you guys focus on two people. So the first one is going to be this guy, Anton van Leeuwenhoek. He was the first one who um, made a very, very simple microscope. And you might have seen it. I'm going to try to draw it, but it's kind of, it kind of looked like a little paddle boat like this, right? And it's very, very small, and it looked more like a magnifying glass than it did a microscope, at least the one that we know today. Uh, but he was the first one who made something like that that would uh, essentially enlarge very, very small things. Um, and he looked at pond water and like you guys maybe watch from the video he also looked at the gunk in his teeth right back then remember they didn't really shower a lot they didn't really brush their teeth so there was really a lot of things to look at back in the day right so that's anton van Leeuwenhoek, and he's credited to be the first person to create a very simple microscope the next person that I want you guys to be aware of is going to be Robert Hooke. He's the one that gave us the word cells, and that's the one that we use nowadays. Um, because when he first looked at a piece of cork, if you know what a cork is, it's like a, um, you ha we have it around campus, you put like little push pins on it, right? So he looked at a piece of cork under the microscope, and it looked like many chambers or many rooms, Right? And so they called it cell. It's kind of like a prison cell, but back then he was thinking about it more in terms of like a monastery. So he's the one that gave us that word, the word cells. Now, after their time, right, um, I guess I should back up a little bit. So before we knew anything about cells, right, they actually didn't really know that that existed. And that's why Anton van Leeuwenhoek's microscope was very, very important was because back in the day, they didn't really know what made people sick, right? They just thought that poor people are always the ones sick. So they thought that your social status had something to do with whether or not you are more likely to be sick. Um, obviously, nowadays, it, it kind of makes sense, right? Because if you are poor, back then especially if you are poor you're probably not living in a very uh, nice place right uh, they didn't have indoor plumbing back then so all the pee and the poo are just on the streets and you're walking on it right you probably didn't have a lot of good food um, and again they didn't really shower or brush their teeth a lot and a lot of the poor people got sick right but as scientists like Anton van Leeuwenhoek and Robert Hook um, started uh, discovering these little tiny things, then that's when they realize eventually that, hey, the social status has really nothing to do with people being sick. It's just that there are these tiny, tiny things like viruses and bacteria that make people sick, right? And so we came up with something called the cell theory. And this one, yes, is very, very important. Make sure you can list all three. So it's three parts. Doesn't really matter which one goes first as long as you name all three, right? So First part says, all living things are made up of cells. And that's true, right? We are living, animals are living. If you have a pet, dog, cat, tortoise, bird, whatever, right? They're living, they're made up of cells. Plants are also living, they are made up of cells. Uh, bacteria, also made up of cells, so they're living. The one that's a little weird are viruses, right? Viruses, as of right now, based off of this theory, it's considered non-living because... I'm going to draw a traditional looking virus for you. So a virus kind of looks like this. You might have seen this structure before, right? The virus only has an outer shell that's made out of protein and then an inner 
uh, compartment that has DNA, right? DNA or RNA, depending on what kind of uh, bacteria, or sorry, what kind of virus it is, right? This one, not made up of cells, right? Now, I say, you know, as of the theory right now, because like I said, theories can always change. So if in the near future, we find something that would change the cell theory, and, you know, might consider viruses living, then we will adopt that uh, eventually. But as of right now, we consider viruses as non-living. Second part is cells are the basic unit of life. And the same thing as the first one, it just means that anything living, right, should be made up of cells. So, you know, in the future, if we find a new species or something, you know, in outer space and we're trying to determine if it's living or non-living, the first thing we need to look at is does it have cells, right? That's the first thing. And then the last one is new cells come from pre-existing cells. So this one is actually a very important concept. Because back in the day, <laughs> lots of things that we didn't know back in the day. But back in the day, they kind of just thought that cells came from nowhere. It's something called spontaneous generation. Right? Spontaneous meaning, again, coming out of nowhere. Right? And then generation meaning generations of cells. So cells after cells after cells. So they thought back then that these cells, you know, like if we talk about bacteria infection for some reason... They just thought that they came out of nowhere. Obviously, that's not the case, right? So I have two experiments for you that you need to know uh, that disprove spontaneous generation. So now this thing, it's no longer valid, right? And again, that's the beauty of science is that sometimes we uh, know something and then later on we learn something else that disproves the other one. This is one of those cases, right? So this first one is the Francisco Reddy 1668 experiment. Um, so let's just take the pictures uh, one at a time, right? So he has these three jars. He has one open jar, one that is covered in gauze. So gauze has holes in them, right? Uh, and then the other one with sealed jars. So they're saying that if spontaneous generation is actually a thing, right? Cells should just come out of nowhere. So that means that this one, this one should show growth even if it's sealed. That's what that means, right? So obviously the open jar one, right? They had some growth because the flies got in there, they laid maggots, and so they got, you know, the maggots in there. For the gauze one, because of the tiny holes in the gauze, even though the flies can't get in there, they could still lay their larva in there. So they got larva in the meat, right? And then the sealed jar, no flies, no maggots, and no eggs because it's completely sealed, right? And again, this disproves, right? We're trying to prove that spontaneous generation is not true. So this disproves it because if, I'll write it down, if spontaneous generation was true, there should be larva in here, right, in the sealed jar, which there isn't. So that's why we disprove it, right? So that's the first one. And I could ask you, so a potential question here is, you know, I could say something like, what did the Francesco Reddy experiment um, say about spontaneous generation? And you can say something like it disproved it because, you know, the sealed jar did not have maggots, blah, 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 whatever, that kind of stuff. Right. So that's the first one. The second one is going to be the Louis Pasteur experiment. And if you've ever looked at um, milk in the grocery store and you might have seen the word pasteurized milk right that is from our guy louis pasteur so he's the one that developed that process for cleaning up our milk essentially so this one with the meat kind of obvious because there's actual flies there right the difference between this one and louis pasteur's experiment is this one they're looking at it uh, in terms of bacteria, which we can't really see without a microscope, right? So what he did is he had three flasks, right? Three containers, if you want to call it that. And then he put broth in there, 
right? And broth, like chicken broth, for example, there's a lot of nutrients in there. So bacteria would really love to eat that and grow, right? And you can try that at home. You can leave a cup of uh, chicken broth out on the counter and see if it'll start getting all um, like cloudy and kind of chunky in a couple days, right? That's what he's doing. So what he did first is he boiled all of the flasks uh, with the broth in it to kill any potential living organisms in there in the very beginning, right? So then what he did is one of them, it's open, right? This is the one that's open. This one has a little bit of a plug on it. And this one is called a swan neck, swan neck or an S neck flask. That's what it's called. Right. So after a couple of days, he, he just leaves it there. He doesn't do anything with it. Right? He just leaves it there. And then after a couple of days, he comes back and he looks at the results. So these are the results here in the bottom. Right. So this is the before and the bottom one is the results. So after a couple of days, he noticed that this one contaminated with bacteria. Right. And again, that should make sense because it's just like leaving a cup of broth on the table. Right. The air around us has bacteria. Every time you pass by, every time you breathe on that cup, right, there's always bacteria in the air. So those little particles got in there and contaminated the broth, right? The second one has the same shape, right, as the first one, but it has this cover right here. It's sealed, right? So because of that, the bacteria couldn't get in, even if, the, even if it's through the air, right? The opening is closed, so they couldn't get in. And again, you can totally redo this experiment at home, right? If you have different jars, leave one open, the other one, close it, right? This one is going to be a little bit difficult because I don't think they sell jars like that, right? But this last one is really the one that gives us strong evidence that spontaneous generation is not true, right? Because you can actually, I'm going to zoom it in a little bit, you can actually see the bacteria trapped right here, right? Because what happens is this uh, opening, this part, it's exposed to the bacteria in the air, just like that. So yes, they get in, right? They do get in. It's just that they can't travel. Bacteria, for the most part, they don't really crawl, right? So they just got stuck right there at the opening. And because they didn't make it in the broth, the broth stayed sterile, meaning there was no bacteria in there. So again, if spontaneous generation was true, this one and this one should have bacteria in it, even though they are sealed, right? That is the main idea. If spontaneous generation was true, this one, right? And this one, should have bacteria in it but because they don't we disprove that idea All right so make sure you guys are comfortable with both of those experiments and i'll be able to explain how or why um, they were used to disprove that idea All right so then let's talk about cells a little bit more we have two types first one is called prokaryotes Second one is called eukaryotes, right? Prokaryotes are usually bacteria. So they're smaller, they have no nucleus, right? An example, like I said, bacteria like E. coli, right? They're very, very small. We can't see them with our naked eye. We would probably need a microscope to see one of them. And again, if you're in 101, I, you might <laughs> be able to see bacteria depending on what you guys look, like, look at, right? But if you uh, definitely go into the scientific field, they will have stuff like that for you, right? Eukaryotes are going to be us, right? So that's going to be humans, animals, uh, plants also are eukaryotes. And how I remember it is this one, you, right? Like pointing at you as a person, I just say you are a eukaryote, right? You are a eukaryote. So this means that they have something called membrane bound organelles, like the nucleus. So this one in high school, you probably heard about one of them has a nucleus and the other one doesn't. That's the same idea. But because this is uh, a step higher than high school, we're going to dig a little bit deeper. So we're going to call them membrane bound organelles, right? They can be unicellular, meaning they can be one cell, 
or multicellular. So an example of mul uh, a unicellular organism would be something like yeast, right? And multicellular would be something like us. Right, so yeast, yes, it's the one. If you're, if you like to bake, that's the one you use, like yeast. Those are single-celled eukaryotes, right? So please make sure you know the difference between a prokaryote and a eukaryote, either in list form or in picture form, which I'm gonna show you right now. For this particular PowerPoint, I'm just going to focus on prokaryotes, and then there will be another lecture video that will talk about eukaryotes, right? So let's take a look at prokaryotes. So that's what it looks like. That's a bacteria. Now, not all bacteria look like that. That's just the most common model that most people have, right? E. coli looks like that. There are some bacteria that are more like circular, right? This is called a rod shape or a bacillus. And then the, the spherical one, right? They're called cosi, like that, right? But all pre... <laughs> all prokaryotic cells no internal compartments or organelles right so that means no nucleus right if we take a look at i'm going to zoom in a little bit if you take a look at the structure of this bacteria it just has this outer green shell little dots inside and then the purple thing which is the dna that's all it has and this tail right but that's all it has it doesn't have any nuclei if you know what a mitochondria is there's no mitochondria and you guys will see the difference a little bit later when we actually lecture about eukaryotes you'll see there's a lot of things in there for bacteria that's it um, and then dna forms in a single chromosome so again that's that purple thing we were just looking at if i just took one end of it and pulled it out it's just one really long one that's what that means Right, and it has a cell wall surrounding its cell membrane that protects, uh, sorry, provides protection and support. And this is a key trait of species for prokaryotes. So that means that all prokaryotes have a cell wall. Right, that's very, very, very important. So I'm going to zoom into the picture again. So let's see. Um, the so this, this one is special because we're going to talk about capsule in just a little bit. But this dark green, I don't know if you guys can see it, but this dark green layer right here, that's the cell wall, right? The yellow right below it, that's the plasma membrane, right? Our cells, I'm going to spoil it a little bit. Human cells do not have a cell wall. We have a plasma membrane, right? But not a cell wall, right? So that's for all prokaryotic cells. And we're going to continue some, because this is not for everybody, but for some prokaryotes, they have something called a capsule. So I'm going to zoom in again. That's the light green one that I kind of skipped on the previous slide, right? So then cell wall is the dark one, and then the yellow one is the plasma membrane, right? So it has like a three-layer protection, whereas our cells, our human cells, we really only have one layer of protection, right? Which... If you think about it, you might think about, okay, well, why does a bacteria need three layers of protection and we only need one? Well, that cell is only one, right? If it doesn't protect itself really well, it's dead. Whereas for us, we have billions and billions of cell, uh, cells. If we lose one cell, then we have the other billion, right? So that's why for them, it's extra important to have that extra layer of protection. Um, they also have something called a flagellum. That's this tail structure right here right it kind of whips around it moves around kind of like a helicopter where it whirls around right that's how they use um, that's what they use to move around um, like your body if it's an infection or outside right for the most part bacteria they don't really move the only time they move is if you touch a surface that has bacteria and then you touch another surface and you transfer it that way right that's why you always want to wash your hands just in case the other vocabulary word is going to be plasmid. Um, we can't really see it from this picture, but plasmids are going to be, if I were to draw it inside this cell, it's going to be like literally a circular extra piece of DNA. So this purple one that we see is the main genetic information for that cell. But some of them, they always have this extra one. I'm going to label it for you guys for your reference. That's called a plasmid. 
It's just extra set of DNA. And this is where we usually get the antibiotic resistant genes is because of that. Because sometimes, or I would say a good portion of the time, a good portion of the time when a bacteria dies, it kind of just it unleashes everything in it so it lets go of this plasmid right and i'm gonna get on my antibiotic resistant pedestal right now but if the doctor prescribes you with an antibiotic let's say he prescribes it to you for a week your doctor right you have this infection so he says he or she says hey take this antibiotic for a week right but then you take it, let's say halfway through the week, you're like, oh, I'm feeling better and I don't want to take my antibiotics anymore. So then you don't take it anymore, right? What happens is that you might not have killed all the bacteria in there, even though you're feeling better, right? It just means that your body has detected very, very low levels of the bacteria that it's not going to alert your immune system, but that doesn't mean that it's all gone. Right. So whenever your doctor prescribes you with antibiotics, make sure you take it all the way, because if you don't kill all the bacteria in there, those bacteria could potentially pick up a plasmid that has antibiotic resistance. Right. And then now you have this bacteria that will eventually, I don't know, evolve into a superbug. And now we can't cure it with antibiotics. So so that's my my little uh tidbit about antibiotics i'm sure i'm gonna say it again later but that's very very important like i said we're just gonna stop right here for prokaryotic cells uh we have one other lecture on eukaryotic cells which we will do in just a little bit so if you have any questions make sure you jot them down and then bring them to class so that i can answer them for you